Hello, and welcome to our program today. My name is Peter Dean. I'm the founder and president of Leaders by Design and executive coaching firm for men. And we are very excited about the content that we're gonna be talking about today and very excited about a panel of experts that we have with us today. So it's going to be an hour that's gonna be full of great information that we can apply to our own lives and to learn from individually. Uh, just to understand where this is coming from, uh, I am co-chair along with my business partner and wife, Molly Shepard, of the Vision 2020 Strategic Committee. And that is supported by President John Fry and is led by the Honorable Lynn Yackel. And we have many other people behind the scenes making all of this work for us today. And we are just very excited. And I'm going to get through some inter introductory remarks first, and then uh, just a wee bit of housekeeping, and then we're going to meet our panel. So um, one, one of the things uh, that I think is uh, very special about this panel, distinguishing it from other panels, is that it's based on a movie that was done, a documentary done, that's The Mask You Live In. And uh, this shows the early conditioning of boys before they become men and the consequences of that early conditioning uh, when they actually do become men. So it's very exciting. Uh, and um, uh, we should uh, recognize that the film has become very popular. Uh, it, it is even uh, shown in Greenwich, Connecticut at the uh, Brunswick School to all second year students. So it's part of the actual curriculum. They get to spend, uh, I think it's one course credit on just discussing the film and applying it to their own lives as sophomores in high school. So uh, it's very exciting. And there are other connections about the film that uh, make it very interesting. Uh, personally, as an executive coach uh, for decades, uh, it, it fits in with the narrative I'm concerned with, uh, and that is what's holding back our executive men from being inclusive leaders. And uh, uh, they understand they want to be inclusive, but they don't realize some of the blind spots and facades that hold them back. So we're going to be talking about that today as well. Uh, in my current book, Cult Cultivating Leaders, uh, I talk about how men and women can lead together. I think that's the ultimate goal where we're going to today. Uh, but also recognizing it's that uh, men recognizing what's holding them back. It's uh, very subtle. So before we meet our panel, uh, let me begin with some housekeeping items. I, I have something I have to read because I don't want to batch it up here. But Vision 2020. Uh, is a nonpartisan national gender equality coalition. Say that fast, huh? And uh, that's the support of, the, it's an entire effort uh, across the United States that Lynn Yako is spare, spearheading. Um, and our goal today is a conversation to, to talk about boys and men. Uh, and under the, the hubris of 2020, uh, Vision 2020. Uh, um, I'll ask you to use your chat feature under your video, please. And uh, any questions that are there, we will get to them towards the end. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to all of them. So with that, uh, allow me to introduce uh, our panel today. And um, See, we have, uh, first I'll introduce uh, Mr. Alan Riddick as a Vision 2020 delegate himself and Director of Supplier Inclusion at Drexel. Uh, his work serves businesses owned by women and owned by people of color. So Alan, I'm gonna ask the same question for all the panel members. Uh, and this is the question. Uh, what message do you want our men to learn from the film? So. Alan. 
Thank you, Dr. Dean. Um, well, first, I want to thank uh, everyone today, and you know, this is an awesome panel panel that that you guys have put together. So I'm, I'm very honored to be on it today. But one thing that I would really want uh, men to really take from this film is one word: authenticity, and really understanding that when you when you deal with the type of conditioning that we see in the movie, particularly from the primary years, toddler years, that um, your conditioning affects, affects how, you, how you act and function in, in society. We see that at an early age in the film, there's a false representation of what, of what men are. There's a false representation and idolization of, of men in sports and, and what that means and, and, and how that and, and how idolizing sports and, 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 and activity creates a dominance in men. We see how some teenagers were, um, were reluctant to get engaged in arts and crafts because of the fear of how they would be viewed. So um, I would definitely say would be authenticity. Um, what, what really kind of um, brought light to me in the film as well is the fact that, and, you know, and, and this is something that really hit home to me is that, you know, as men, we are really taught not to cry. We're not really taught to express mo uh, emotions. So with that, you know, there, it takes significant work, even in your adult years, to really reprogram the conditioning, the emotional conditioning that that has that has been endured with, within one's 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 life. Okay, thank you, Alan. That's mm -hmm. very good. Uh, next, we'll go to Dr. Heldman, Dr. Carolyn Heldman. Uh, and again, there's so much I have to read this because I couldn't memorize it all. As a leading author, researcher, educator, and commentator, you've, you have uh, really helped shape the national conversation about issues of gender and power, uh, something I confront as a coach all the time. Uh, and in fact, uh, not only are you interviewed extensively, but you also served as executive director for the Representation Project the organization that created the film itself. So uh, Dr. Heldman, uh, what message do you want, uh, having so much experience with the film, uh, are men to take away from the film? Well, I will build on what Alan said and just first to say it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Dr. Dean and the 2020 Vision Project and the Representation Project. Uh, but to build on that, uh, I think that that a lot of men that I've heard from who've seen the film say, oh, I thought I was experiencing this alone, right? Um, this idea that, that you're not actually alone, that there are social structures in place. Uh, the man box is very limiting. It's very constricting. It, it forces boys and men to cut off parts of their humanity, you know, as Alan was pointing out, just something as simple as pursuing creativity and crafts. And so um, I, I think maybe two messages, one that, that you're not experiencing this alone. And the second part of that, uh, the, the two would be um, the freedom to not bifurcate your head and your heart, right? The freedom uh, to be a fully emotional human being, one who feels and expresses, we all feel, uh, but one who feels comfortable uh, expressing your emotions emotions and being a fully, you know, fully human, as we like to say, um, and, and giving boys and men permission to do that through a medium like a documentary. Okay. Uh, I'm curious, and we'll probably ask later about uh, what men are missing out on by not uh, recognizing their emotions. And we'll get that because both you and Alan connected with that. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, okay, Michael. Michael is a leader at Catalyst, a global nonprofit organization that works with some of the world's most powerful companies uh, to build workplaces that work for women. Not only that, but he's played a pivotal role in the development of Catalyst's MARC program. MARC stands for Men Advocating Real Change, uh, and it's an initiative uh, by Catalyst. Uh, and he's also uh, Visions 2020 first ever male delegate. So congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Thank what, you, Dr. Uh, Dean. Welcome. What message uh, do you want our, our men to take from the film? 
Well, I, I too, I want to echo the comments of uh, the fellow participants. Just very thankful to be here, honored. Um, I love that uh, our work is happening in this collaborative partnership more so now than in the many years we've been doing all of this work. So I, I feel the movement happening and I'm so thankful and proud to be a part of it. Um, I think the message I would love people to leave with today, if possible, is the power of individual influence. Um, I think many of us feel, and men especially, I think in the conversation we'll have about this restrictive man box that uh, Caroline mentioned, I, I, I'm hopeful that people will feel empowered and that their individual choices and participation in the, an inclusion discussion is much more powerful and broad sweeping than they might give credit for. So um, I'm hoping when individuals walk away from today, they'll feel that change is within their grasp and within their influence. Okay, thank you, Michael, and thank you, thank you for coming aboard here. Um, okay, so I, I'm just ready to go here. Uh, Carolyn, just first question, masculinity is not organic. It is not something that just happens. It's a rejection of everything that is feminine. So uh, can you start us off from <laughs> and help people understand what you're, what you're saying there? Because that's such an important point. Yeah, so the broader point being that gender roles are constructed, right? And we know that they're socially constructed because they vary very widely from culture to culture. They vary within a culture uh, by subculture. Um, they vary over time very quickly within a culture. And I'll just give you a few examples. Um, you know, thinking back to uh, the 1970s and modes of masculinity and disco, think about that for a moment, how much has shifted in terms of dominant modes of masculinity and what is cool. Um, not that that was the only mode at the time, but it gives you a, a sense of how rapidly we've changed just in the past half a century. Or looking back to you know 250 years ago, our founding fathers uh, were the height of masculinity, hegemonic masculinity, meaning what is most widely accepted in a society, and they were wearing uh, you know tights and wigs and powder. Um, I mean, they were, they were uh, performing masculinity in a way that would not be acceptable today because modes have shifted. So all of this to say that masculinity and femininity are uh, socially constructed roles. So then that brings up the question of, well, how do we construct masculinity? And in, in the modern era, we construct it in ways that are really damaging to boys and men. Um, we, it's not organic in the sense that it's a reaction to rejecting everything that's feminine. So when you think about how boys learn how to be men, um, how do we do this? We tell them to that they can't cry, that they have to reject everything that's feminine, right? They can't wear certain colors. Um, you know, and again, boys don't cry being this really dominant thing or throw growing like a girl, you can't do all of these things that are feminine. And so um, we, we raise our little boys to be a reaction and also to denigrate the feminine. And so then, you know, they become adults and we expect them to somehow respect women. Um, and it, it's just, you know, it's, I call it the great setup, right? Um, but I'm really focused on how it harms boys and men to uh, not only be taught to reject things that are feminine as a core part of their identity, uh, but also taught to suppress emotions and what that does um, to their heart. And we know, you know, there's a lot of good data that shows that boys and men actually um, pass away at higher rates at every age because of masculinity. So masculinity literally kills boys and men uh, in the sense that um, they're much more likely to uh, die by suicide because they're not getting the mental health that they, that they need at the same rates. Um, and so also physical health, they're less likely to go to the doctor if there's a physical problem, they're less likely to be compliant if there is a physical problem. Um, all of this plus high risk behaviors that they're encouraged to do in order to perform masculinity uh, mean that, that masculinity is a killer. Um, so, it, and, and that's the extreme of it. I think the everyday of it is that uh, a lot of boys and men don't feel that they can have close friendships with other men. So they lose out on that. Um, their, their emotional and mental health is not fed in a way that it should be. So um, my, my concern is really to focus in on the, the harm to boys and men, that the ways in which we construct masculinity, um, you know, create these worlds for them. Uh, lovely, and it just so happens a question came in from our chat room about how do cultures influence raising boys? And you touched on that. So I'm gonna open it up to Alan and Michael. You want a piece of what Caroline just said, please? Absolutely, well, you know, um, Caroline actually said something that, that didn't stick to me or didn't really 
clicked to me when I saw the movie. But um, when she mentioned, you know, in the, the relationship between father and son, and so so we have to take take a look at in, in regards to the damage that is being done. And if you if you watch the film, there was a lot of um, I would say lost um, lost love between between father and son um, that 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 I can that I think many many men can can really relate to just from the the, the simple fact when. In, in the film, it indicated, you know, stop, stop, stop crying. But you know, as Caroline mentioned, um, be, being emotional is a part of of the body's healing process, and so, mm -hmm. and crying is as crying is, has been proven to release um, chemicals within what's inside your body that will actually heal you and 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 help you uh, um, become better better emotionally. So I I would say the father and son di dynamic and. We see even from cultures, from from different cultures, we see a, a common, a common um, trait, which is communication. We see a common trait, and and, and that's from white, black, we, we, um, Asian, all different cultures. That's a common, common uh, thread there in regards to how father and sons communicate to each other, and the false representations that fathers put towards their sons to think a certain way, feel a certain way, and behave a certain way. Lovely, well said. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I would like to add a piece to that. I think the, the end of what, what both of the fellow panelists here have talked about, kind of this conditioned, restrictive masculinity, a certain prescribed role. I think a part I would add to that is the role that other men also take in policing those, that restrictive norm, mm -hmm. um, even if they don't want to. So, you know, from Catalyst, I, I think my lens is uniquely qualified to talk um, about the workplace and the cultures that exist there. Um, I, I think when men enter the workplace, everything that's been talked about, the certain type of leadership attributes that are valued um, and, you know, codified as masculine, you know, aggressive personalities, workaholics, in it for the win and, and those types of things. If you step out of that prescribed behavior, there are other men waiting to police you. Um, and so there's, there's, a real, there's a real fear to step out of that for that fear of being policed. And then for, for men that are advocates of inclusion, there's a tension built in. I think I should be part of the policing culture or I should be celebrating that this man had the courage to step out and celebrate these other characteristics, characteristics that might've been you know, historically codified as feminine. Um, and so I think the policing characteristic is a very powerful cultural aspect that we also need to discuss when we're talking about the roles individual men are taught to be or emulate or role model as well. Well said, thank you. Caroline, any, anything you wanna to add to that before we go to the next question? No, okay. Um, Dr. Dean, can I, can I add something to that there? Absolutely. So I just, know, I just noticed, uh, uh, you know, something that Mike or, or Michael and I probably have in common besides being he for she's, we've, we've probably faced some of the same, same, same judgment for being a, a he for she. And so, you know, I've, you know, I, I sometimes get asked, well, you know, what do you, what do you care so much for? And my first answer is that, you know, my, 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 my mother's a woman. So, <laughs> so, and, and we all had that in common. So, but, but Mike, I, I think it's really unique there. I've never thought about that. that. And so now I, I consider myself a he for she. And, 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 and I have felt the same uh, criticism in, in regards to um, being, be, being, being connected to um, other, other, uh, uh, the, the, the other gender. So Alan, let's go with that. Uh, how does your work complement uh, the themes we're talking about today in the film, the, the work you actually do there? Well, my, my work is to help correct the 250 years of, of, of men dominating the workforce. My work is, is to help encourage the 114% growth in women business in the last 20, 20, 20 years. Uh, my work is to help uh, my, my partners and my, my, um, my fellow employees, uh, other members within my community to help understand that, that every day since 2016, over 1,100 new businesses were, were, were started by, by, by women. So, so with that, you know, I work for towards inclusion, 
um, and, 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 and particularly in making sure that our procurement, Drexel's procurement team stay, stays engaged, ensuring that, that we are offering and, and, and allowing open and equal purchasing and procurement opportunity for all, for all businesses. Okay, and uh, Michael, does that relate to the work at Mark? Yeah, yeah. It, it does. And uh, I'll, I'll just briefly explain that. I mean, Catalyst 2 is all about inclusion and, and building workplaces that uh, where women and particular women of color can thrive. Um, you know, we've spent decades teaching women how to navigate a man's world that we've forgot that the men are in it as well. Um, and so Mark is something that we started at Catalyst um, a little over a decade ago. Uh, really to evaluate what are the characteristics of the men that are visible champions of inclusion. And in comparison to that, what's, what's, what are the barriers keeping more men from kind of tipping into that category? And we found, you know, these, these areas of the restrictive masculinity and, and um, you know, the policing uh, component by other men and other women in, in some categories, I, I would say. But we also are finding more and more with each day, the culture how important that the organization's culture is. And so creating cultures of inclusion, which for us at Catalyst really is about um, cultures that allow uniqueness in a belonging way so that you know, we can value difference rather than manage it, et cetera. Um, and I, I think you know, with each thing that happens in our society, we gain more and more awareness. It's utilizing that awareness now as an advantage to change the future, right? And I think now we're watching the pandemic impact women and women of color in devastating, devastating ways. Uh, we need male champions to step up at this moment, but we need organizational leaders. And in fact, every employee of those organizations believing that there's a different cultural opportunity ahead, um, not just rebuilding what we had, which is this toxic masculine, all men work, workplace. It's an opportunity to rebuild, not go back to what was. Okay. Lovely. Um, I want to stay on this masculinity theme. Just one more questions, and then we'll get to other things. But um, since uh, you know what we're talking about is the extreme of masculinity, is that the the men are encouraged to get as far away from femininity as possible. Uh, uh, what can we do to get the men and the women kind of moving toward each other? I mean, what what are those steps? to help the men and the women get, especially in the workplace, uh, especially centered around power. So maybe Caroline, you could start us off with that. Um, I, I encounter that all the time and I just would love some guidance on what, where, where are the next steps there? Well, to think really far in the future, um, I envision a world in which gender is no longer a category that's used to organize the world. So I'm a, I'm a binary abolitionist. I actually don't believe gender uh, serves an important function other than stratification. Um, I have yet to see any good evidence uh, as to why we need to structure our society by gender. I think we would all benefit if we broadened the concept of parenting, for example, uh, to have good standards for parenting, regardless of, of whether you're a man, a woman, a gender non-conforming person. Uh, the same with the workplace. I actually think that all of these, uh, well, I know that uh, based upon Catalyst data, the best, the gold standard, um, I know that the more inclusive a workforce is, the better it is for everyone. So if you have childcare, that's gonna benefit everyone. If you have a culture uh, that values differences and, and as Michael pointed out, doesn't try to manage them, um, it's actually, it provides for more of the authenticity that Alan mentioned earlier. And so um, I think structurally um, putting, recognizing, uh, and, and just to echo what Michael said, uh, recognizing that the culture is the most important component in a workplace. So everything else is gonna flow from that. And where does the culture come from? It comes from the top. It comes from what behaviors are encouraged and what behaviors are discouraged. Um, and so I think what's great about the workplace is however you wanna be in your personal life. And I mean, in terms of your indulging your biases or, or ignorance, um, when you go to work, you have to be your best person. And so it, you have to legally be your best person, right? You can't, there are all sorts of things you cannot do in the workplace that you could do in your private life. And, and not that I love, you know, kind of the law and order side of that, but that tells us about the cultures that we want to create. These are 
public spaces. They are spaces where implicit bias and explicit bias cannot rule the day. It is illegal for that to be the case, right? And so um, I think starting from the premise that leaders shape the culture and that the culture is the most important aspect of the workplace, putting in systemic routinized um, essentially rules um, that are well enforced, and I don't mean a heavy hand, but well enforced, um, will create the culture that you want. And so starting from the top, starting from the vision of the culture that you want, and then setting up your rewards, your incentives, as well as your boundaries for saying, look, this is how our community operates. And I would actually take that model and apply it to campuses, to any institutions um, where the cultures, you know, where, where the culture either exacerbates problems or has an opportunity to intervene. And I see workplaces as spaces of intervention against the bias of the broader culture. Okay, so let me just do a little bit of an experiment here. I'm going to be your client, all three of you, and I'm coming to you and I'm, I'm admitting that I, I see that I need to be more inclusive. You know, I'm an executive and I need to be more inclusive and I want to be a better man. You've got a client in front of you that wants to be a better man. I, I mean, someone might look at me and said, Peter, you should have started a little earlier, but uh, who, whatever the client is, they're coming. What, what would be the conversation you would have with that person right there and then? And I'd love to hear all from all three of you on that. Alan, Peter, my, uh, the first thing I would I would do was uh, con congratulate you for one not not being defensive and and being able to to look at oneself. And it, it, it takes guts. It takes, it, takes, it, it takes a lot of guts to be able to ag acknowledge um, hey, you know, that I, I may have some, I may have bias issues. And, and so with that, the second thing I would say is that, Peter, you, need, you may need to go through, through training. And, and you may need to, and, and training is actually ongoing. And kind of what Caroline was even mentioning as well is that organizations as a whole, higher education, Corporate America need need to understand that part of uh, part of the hiring process is the training process regarding diversity and inclusion. So, so you're assuring me of safety. I'm, I'm going to be yes. in a safe zone if you and I talk Correct. about that. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Michael, Carolyn. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll add a little. I mean, I, I think one. I think one of the things that we miss sometimes in addressing um, inclusion through our training programs and our interventions for lack of a better word, um, is that we do believe or have believed that a policy can fix things and that a program or diversity training will fix things. But I think what we're seeing in society is that we are well beyond that. Um, and that those programs and policies, they are absolutely essential, but they're insufficient. And we need accountability. And I, I wanna build on what Caroline was saying because I think it's, it's so important is, and from my perspective at Catalyst, and I've been working with the organization for just shy of 16 years, um, I've consulted with a lot of organizations that have tried to, re, tried to use reward programs with their leadership. Um, and so their numbers looked good, their retention numbers for women and people of color looked good and they were given rewards. And I think that's a good motivator. Money certainly <laughs> will motivate many of us. But what was, all, what was lacking was the stick, right? So the carrot was there, but the stick was something. And so actually implementing accountability systems and following through on those accountability systems and saying that you know, through performance measures that mm -hmm. diversity is not a nice to have, but it's a mandatory direction that this organization is going in and you gotta be on the ride. I think more of that accountability part, that component, we need more of that. We need more visible evidence of that. Without it, what we will see are employees taking to the streets and demanding it. So I think that organizations are going, we're in that tension right now. We're watching it in almost everything we're seeing happen in the world, right? The pandemic has turbocharged the future of work work that we've all been doing. And I think most people that have started to do diversity and inclusion as a program that they've added to their company have rewarded those incremental betterments versus the profound change that we all need. And we don't have the luxury of that anymore. Um, and so I think that we need to have, we need to focus on cultures and we need to have that top down visible commitment and visible accountability to, you know, these are not nice to have, these are the absolute new direction of our organization. Um, and then implement programs and policies that train people, build awareness, 
um, allow people the mentoring and sponsorship that they need to navigate the cultures as they learn them and contribute to building them anew. So, but I, but I would also echo uh, um, just a bit of what Alan said. It is big work. It's a lot of work. It's hard work. But that should not. We should not allow that to prevent us from from starting to do the work. And I think that requires a little bit of courage. For men, it requires a lot of humility. Um, we have to enter this space seeking to understand the experience of other people um, and acknowledging that we don't know it, uh, You know that everybody's experience is different. So it's a lot of humility, um, yeah. something that used to be characterized, I would say, as a women's you know, soft skill. Uh, so how radically that has changed too, right? These soft skills have become the mandatory leadership skills of the future, like that. Um, and so I think our women have a lot to teach people, but we should not rely on the women to do all the teaching. So, you know, we have to encourage men to understand that their role to play is building partnership, not zero sum. They're not gonna give much up in order to allow other people to thrive. And so it's, it's really having courageous conversations with folks, being open-minded, empathetic. Um, and then the accountability part, I would echo. If, if we don't follow through with accountability, then this is just an organic conversation that's going to go away. Yeah, I had one uh, executive actually tell me, uh, ask me what empathy was to actually define it because uh, it wasn't quite sure about that. Caroline, um, uh, can you say something about emotion and the, the fear men have about emotion? I, I think that's something our listeners would love to hear you talk about. Well, we certainly associate emotions with women, right? As Michael just pointed out, these soft skills, um, the idea that caring about other people, I, and I would argue, um, you know, care in general, which is the dis a display of emotion or empathy, right, um, is seen as a, a feminine domain. Um, it means that women are more likely in their families to be kin keepers. They're more likely to know what is going on in their families. They're more likely to be the ones who provide care. Um, and wow, what a what a thing for men for centuries to have, have not given up. That's not the right word because it's not a choice, right? Uh, but, but that's a, we know in terms of human happiness, there are two things that bring human happiness. Uh, one are close connections to others and the other is, is helping others. So put those two things together, that's caring. And yet men are not allowed by the social rules of, of real manhood to in, engage in that, right? So um, I, I think it's, a lot of men are waking up to this as in the, the past couple of decades and saying, actually, we reject that model. Um, and I think when it, when it comes to your CEO or your, the person that you're advising, Dr. Dean, in, in your executive coaching business, um, you know, I, I would just build on what others have said. Um, one thing that strikes me is uh, in order to do the, the carrot and the stick, you need data. You actually need to know where the problem is. And so putting in systematic uh, mechanisms for gathering data about where the holes are, where the progress uh, remains um, is important. But also I think uh, an understanding that um, it's not, you know, to really hammer home the accountability mechanisms, it's not enough to raise awareness. If it was enough to simply raise awareness, then social movements would just have to raise awareness and the accountability would magically come into play, right? Um, but it doesn't work that way. And I think the reason it doesn't work that way, or one, one big part of that is that we don't acknowledge that we're actually talking about shifting systems of power. And people who have power do not like to give it up. And if they're in a situation where it feels like, you know, and even if they're not being explicit about it or they may not have the words for it, it doesn't feel good to lose power. Um, even if you haven't gained it through merit, it, you've gained it based on your identity. And I think, you know, having a real conversation about the fact that we live in a culture that values men more than women, it's called patriarchy. We value white people more than people of color it's called the white supremacy system. We value people without disabilities more than people with disabilities, right? Ableism. Um, we value people with small and medium body sizes over, over people with large body types, fat phobia and sizeism. We value younger workers over older workers, right? Ageism. Um, we value uh, heterosexual people more than people who are LGBTQIA. We have transphobia and heteronormativity at play. I think having real talk conversations about the fact that these systems are at play and that it is hard to give up power um, in a way that doesn't trigger the defensiveness, right, that Alan talked about. Um, and I think that's the catch because at the end of the day, 
It's not fun to give up power, even if you haven't earned it. It's not fun to give up unearned privilege. It just isn't. Okay, well said. What about generational differences? Is that factoring in here? Uh, first Caroline and then maybe uh, Michael and Alan. Well, I will just, I, I'm talking a lot. So I will just say that I uh, have seen some very positive shifts with millennial and uh, generation X um, people. So Gen X, 56% are gender fluid, meaning that they don't really buy into the binary. So we're definitely, I think, be, mostly because of social media and some other trends, we're starting to see the breakdown of gender as this organizing principle. Um, so there's more freedom for masculinity. I would say that the man box is still being implemented. Uh, the social policing is still happening from other men. The baton still being passed father, sometimes mother down to son. Uh, but all of that is loosening and we're certainly seeing um, more play in terms of social media and mainstream media when it comes to gender roles. Okay, well said. Um, and uh, let's extend that to Alan and Michael. Any commentary on that? Absolutely. Michael, you want to go? Or, yeah, Alan, go ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. Absolutely. I, I, I would actually bring that when you go from a generational perspective. And even in the, in the film, we saw um, there was one example where it was, it was actually two children, one, and they were probably under nine, nine, 10 years old. One wanted to be an investment banker and the other wanted to be a football player. And so what I'm still seeing in our culture is that at a young age, um, we are influencing our children to, to, to idolize and compare um, greatness to things that are of, of masculine, of, of money and, and, and really setting them in the wrong direction. Uh, a quote in the, in the film was, comparison is a thief of all happiness. So, so if, we, if we neglect to allow our children to, to identify and adopt their own um, identity and, 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 their own, and their own wants, and, um, we, are, we are really creating a, a curse that will continuously be generational. Okay, well said, Michael. Well said, Alan. Gee. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't want to be pessimistic, but, uh, but I'll say again, with, you know, with several years of uh, consulting also <laughs> under my belt here, I think that there, I hear and have heard a lot about waiting for the next generation um, to come in and with them comes the change that we all are admiring, you know, admiring that it's over there, but we're admiring it. Um, but I think, what, I think what we're missing is, is this power of assimilation. And that, you know, they're, they're, these, the younger generations do have a lot of change in, in how they view things and value things, which I think is an incredibly important word um, that we've all used um, here thus far. But I think they enter into a system that has systemic and rigid stuff embedded in the culture. And so for, I'll give you an example. Um, Catalyst did a study a few years back about um, uh, what we call that, we, we, we referred to it as the high potential study. Uh, it was a series of research about um, uh, done globally, young individuals leaving master's programs and entering the workforce. And we looked at that data across multiple regions and um, made it as equivalent as we possibly could. And what we found was at the same role with the same education and the same job requirements that women on average were getting $4,600 less than their male counterpart for the exact same job. So their aspirations and their desires to have greater equity and flexibility and you know, appreciation for the non-binary, that's all well and good, but the system prevents it from happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because, and then so you quickly assimilate if you want to, to navigate that workplace or thrive even, um, or you leave um, and start you know, your own business or join another organization and, and et cetera. And, that cycle will go on and on and on until we break down the cultural systems that those organizations embrace and hold tight to, largely unconsciously, I might add, yeah. um, you know, and try to do our best to eradicate the biases that are in there um, and start with inclusion in mind, like the destination postcard. Well, what will it take for us to get there? And then evaluate our systems from a clean point. I would also agree with what Caroline said about, you know, kind of what measure about measurement. I think we've said at Catalyst for years and years, well before me, what gets measured gets done. Data is an extraordinarily powerful tool, but so is storytelling. Um, and so I think that, you know, we need, we need more 
uh, cultures that embrace storytelling, opportunities to seek out difference and share those stories, embrace those stories, see them as valuable, not just you know the highlight in the newsletter, et cetera, that will get the change moving at least directionally and then empowering the people to just, as I said earlier, the individual sphere of influence, teaching people what it's like to interrupt bias when it happens in their organizations safely, without penalty. Those are the tools that we can provide to people after we've built the awareness, or in fact, while. We probably should do all of this concurrently if we want this to happen quickly. Um, but you know, to the point made earlier, awareness is great but radically insufficient if you don't provide people the tools to do something a bit more productive, proactive, et cetera. So we have to do both. Yeah, uh, lovely. Very nicely said. Uh, just a change of direction here a little bit. Has the pandemic helped us or hindered us in our path here? Well, now, just, well, Michael just you know, nailed it there in regards to um, wages. So we have to, let's, let's remember here now, $4,600 less. And, and Michael, I'm, I'm going to bring the data aspect back to it as well. So our federal government understands, understands that women are paid less than men. Matter of fact, the U.S. Census Bureau, I think they had it, they marked it at 84 cents on a dollar. However, during a pandemic, imagine what What's being what's happening with millions and millions of women throughout, the, throughout our country, not being paid justly, and and dealing with it with a pandemic on top of that. So so my my whole take on that and, and my biggest concern with uh, gender equality, um, and or or gender inequality is is from a wage perspective. Okay. Anybody else want a piece of that? I just want to add. If, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll add one. I'll add one thing. One thing quickly to what Alan said. I think that that the pay is is is. I mean, that's paramount. Um, also, you know, one of these kind of rigid masculine norms, in quotes, I'll use, is most of the most powerful organizations, and especially those that Catalyst work with, like the Fortune 500, multinationals, etc. They are all built on what I describe as the typical male life cycle, right? So for years we've seen that when women become um, of parenting age and have to step out or to, to you know kind of maybe dial back their their career a bit in order to have children and then you know take care of them if they're the primary caregiver etc. It's very difficult to get back in. Um, it's very difficult for that time out or dial down not to be lost. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And and so I think imagine what it's like. Well, imagine what it will be like to try to get these women that we've lost in the pandemic back into the workplace, unless there isn't radical change done to not only welcome them back, but recruit them back. Um, and so, you know, given that, because I do think to your point about the pandemic, as I said, it's turbocharged everything. It's exaggerated all the bad stuff. And I think the one good note is it's exaggerated the awareness. So we have much more to build on if there was resistance before and there still will be. I, I don't know how we can't, how we will still embrace that resistance. It has to move out of the way. So I'm hopeful that the pandemic exposed everything both good and bad about us so that we can start factually. And, and as many are saying, build back better. But we have to do that not just as a slogan, but with some real truth, real courage, empathy, compassion for one another, et cetera, and really solid storytelling and dedicated leaders who are willing to just see it for what it is, what it was, and build something better for the future. Okay, Dr. Heldman, I know you had comment there. Yeah, I would, I would add to what both um, Alan and Michael have said uh, about the pandemic. I think it's revealed that the gains that have been made really intensely for women in the workforce in the past 50 years are quite tenuous because we actually haven't set up decent systems, even pre-pandemic. And, and so the pandemic is uh, disproportionately affecting women and especially women of color uh, in at least four ways. One is that they're the majority of the front line of healthcare workers, right? So they're literally on the front lines um, and experiencing um, the everything that goes with that, including loss of life at higher, you know, higher rates for frontline workers. Also, um, you know, women of color in particular are more likely to be service workers. And so they're on the front lines in a different way 
in the pandemic. Um, also parenting roles and what's happening in the household. So women are taking and why are women leaving the workforce at higher rates? Because they are uh, assumed to be the caretakers at home. And so they're doing more of the homeschooling. They're doing more of, of the childcare that otherwise would have been provided by um, child other, other workers and support services outside the home. And lastly, you know, sexual and domestic violence rates have increased. And we have anecdotal evidence of this and then some good data um, that being in, in a home uh, increases in, in, your, in that situation, increases the likelihood that it will boil over. So it really just has exposed um, how much gender justice work we have to do in the home as well as the workforce. Okay, uh, delightful answers. Thank you all. Uh, we have a few chat questions uh, I'll insert here. One is about how does religion play a part in this effort? Well, speaking of culture, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll chime in, I, if, I, if I may, or, and, and I'll, share, I'll share a story. I mean, I grew up in Canada um, in a very Catholic upbringing, in fact, went to an all boys boarding school very early on. Um, and I, I understood as normal what the boundaries were for my masculinity and my femininity, for lack, you know, to borrow the binary for a moment. Um, and I knew what penalties existed, learned the hard way when I stepped out of those. In fact, I remember them for my entire life um, <laughs> and in this adulthood where I now sit. And that's what's so powerful about this film, by the way. Yeah. I, I yeah. wanna make sure that I bring it back to the value of the mask because yeah. I mean, to hear those stories, I don't, I've never met a parent who would tolerate that experience for their children, boys, girls, other. Um, and I don't, even, even the adults I've met without children, hearing that story, that, hearing those stories that the film shows us, not portrays, this is not you know, a story of fiction, I think is a, very, is, a, is a huge motivator for change. And so if we can get our organizational cultures, our religious cultures, if we can have, if we can embrace the idea of a more open dialogue without penalty and without pushback and without judgment, I think that we will see that even in pockets that are extraordinarily restrictive, that they, we have space to be open and brave with one another. And that's where change will happen. It's the seed of it anyway. And, and this would be helpful in raising our boys, wouldn't it? Uh, in terms of uh, differentiating uh, belief systems from um, you know, what we're talking about, the idea of masculinity and femininity. Um, I, I'm kind of uh, not reading the entire question here. Uh, how do we get people to become educated about cultures that are different from their own if they're stuck in their own socioeconomic world? So that, that's a chat question. Anybody wants to address that? I'll jump in here. I, there's a, a relatively new concept of uh, cultural humility, right? This idea, uh, and this doesn't directly get at that question, but it, the idea that you can't actually ever really understand someone else because of all of the intersecting identities they have in their culture, um, but that instead of of trying to learn or commodify learning about another culture, right? Like I'm gonna read this checklist um, that it's very much about being open to the idea that you can't know. And then that level of humility gets you much closer in understanding who that person is. And I would say that at this point with the internet, and I know that it is not equally distributed, but at this point with access to media and social media, uh, it has to be willful ignorance. If you don't know about other cultures, that's got to be a choice. You, you're putting on the blinders because, my goodness, we're being exposed. We're, we're a transnational, uh, global group of folks at this point, given what's available at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. Well, well said. Thank you. Thank you for that. We have, um, we have a question coming in asking about the an understanding of strength when you think about men and strength, you think about men in their male role as the man in the box, as we've been talking about. Is there a new connotation of strength that we're developing with this? I would, I would say yes. I, I would say this new role of strength is really um, the power, the process to self-evaluate your conditioning 
and and being and being able to um, be comfortable stepping into into other other cultures and being um, and being open to other cultures and 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 genders you know and learning and learning from them as well. Uh, this is kind of off topic, but I, I do want to kind of point this as an example because uh, Go ahead. Caroline talked about culture and, and the importance of it. Yesterday, I, 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 I had a virtual uh, Black History Month month lunch, and, and the meeting before it, I was with um, two Caucasian colleagues, and and one of them happened to say, you know, that she that she, she didn't know whether she would whether she would be invited to to a Black History Month month luncheon, and and that's that's the type of uh, area where we had to kind of improve on and think about is that, and mm -hmm. for us to to really become. Uh, mm -hmm. A, a true, true, true unified society. We have to really embrace and accept each other's cultures. That's why New York City is probably one of, still the best city because of all the culture there together, finding the huge melting pot that that totally exists. So, so I would say is being able to be to, to be open to other culture and and understanding that and that you also have to be willing to let others in as well. So kind of what Carolina Michael was saying is letting go of that particular power. Okay, uh, so just uh, uh, using what Alan just said, but uh, just reconnecting it with the uh, an understanding of strength, uh, a new, uh, you know, a new or better understanding of strength. To, would any one of you care to comment on that, Michael? You were shaking your head, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think what we know through the research that we've done at Catalyst is that, you know, I, I think that one thing that we need to be very um, aware about when we have conversations, I think as leaders within organizations or as parents of children, if we're ever having this more inclusive conversation or aspiring to have more inclusive conversations, I think acknowledging that women have been punished when they have emulated male strength in the past, right? So they're either too soft, too weak. I call it the Goldilocks syndrome, but they're never quite right, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if they act like men, we hate them. And if they act like women, then they're not mm -hmm. strong enough, et cetera. Um, that that narrative alone should wake us up to the fact that you know strength should come in all, and we should learn to embrace it in all of its diverse forms. But until we stop rewarding certain types of strengths and penalizing other types of strengths, the rules will dictate how we behave. You know, especially in the workplace. In the world, maybe a little bit more broad. We have uh, perhaps some more leniencies or other portrayals that motivate us. But in the workplace, to Carolyn's or earlier point, there are rules. <laughs> there are rules of behavior and there are penalties when you break them. And I think that we have to get really smart about the rules so that we stop rewarding certain types of behaviors and stop penalizing others, unless they're behaviors that deserve penalty, you know, quite frankly. But it comes in the form of those traditionally soft skills or call, what were called soft skills and reevaluating them as future of work skills. Um, and then the, pe the, the reward and penalty models must shift as well. Yeah, I'd like the future work skills. That works, that works for me. Um, uh, it's, uh, and it's, it's very important to add those skills on. You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Some people are very efficient being effective and so on. Um, but uh, the idea that you know, the higher up in an organization you go, the more relationships are become even more important. And uh, relationships are part of the uh, soft skill set, which I find um, uh, difficult. Uh, that, that men kind of say, well, I, you know, I'm just uncomfortable doing that, uncomfortable feeling that. Um, so, uh, Caroline, I didn't want to overlook uh, your response to that. Uh, train, if you could follow it <laughs> as we were going here. Any comments? No. I, I mean, I would love to see strength redefined as the strength to be vulnerable and authentic, um, but that's more, you know, pie in the sky. That's that's how I would like our culture to view strength. I think we all have experienced cultures and organizations that uh, were pitiful. Uh, and how they treated each other. And so uh, the work ahead of us. So uh, with that, trying to get to a positive thing before we finish, uh, I have a question for all three of you, and it's uh, one we kind of touched on, but maybe we could more directly answer right now. And that is, uh, what do men miss out on 
by, by hiding their emotions. Growth. Okay, so say more, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Growth. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. I, I must miss you there. So when I say growth, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about um, we all have a responsibility, whatever religion you, 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 you believe in, we all have a responsibility to be the best human for, for, for the God in which we believe in. And so how do you, you in, in order to elevate, you really have to acknowledge of how ignorant you are. Um, the first step towards knowledge is knowing that you are ignorant. And so, so keeping that that in mind, that's why I, I, I answered that, Peter, with with growth. Okay, uh, I I get it. I, I got the one word too. Uh, I just wanted you to say more. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, anybody else want to go after that one? I had a, a few more words, but all <laughs> pertaining to growth. Thank you, Alan. Um, you know, friendship, connection, healing. Um, knowing oneself and love. Okay, lovely. I'm glad we got there. Lovely. Say more about that, because uh, again, uh, you know, they'll if I'm talking to an executive, they'll rush me out of their office whenever a word like that comes up. So, um, can you? How do you angle that into the conversation? Well, I. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one, right? And, and I think the most effective strategies have been folks in, this, in the pro healthy masculinity space actually performing masculinity in order to convince men who buy into these kind of model, the, the box of masculinity um, to, to rethink it. And it's a really interesting thing and I won't name names, but like, you know, former football players who will get up there and, and use their deep voice and talk about how important it is to love other men, right? Um, so I think that that's an effective approach, like performing it. And, and I do that, right? I, I perform a certain brand of, of, of white femininity in order to talk, for example, about white supremacy. Like it's, it's a strategy um, and maybe I shouldn't ad admit that, but I see this strategy a lot in, in masculinity spaces. I think it's very effective, right? So performing your most manly masculinity when you're talking about love and friendship and connection. Um, but in terms of the, the, the logic of it, um, I think an effective strategy is to say, look, the best parts of being human are not accessible to men if you buy into toxic masculinity. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, I just am learning so much here. I don't want this to end, so I'm trying to get my questions out here. Um, so uh, all three of you, what behavior would you like uh, to see men change the most? I mean, we're talking about a lot of different behaviors. What's on the top of that cube for you? I would say friendships with other men, men um, giving themselves permission to have deep and meaningful relationships with other men. It could change the world. Instead of that competitive thing all the time. Okay. Yeah, I, right. I would absolutely agree with that. And my answer to that, you know, the one word question that you were asking earlier, um, I would also build on what my, my new friends have said is, is everything, You're missing out on everything. And the, you know, the reason, I think we all have experienced something We've all been in the workplace where we saw something and wish later that we had said something, right? That thought, that thing that we're carrying is called emotional tax. And imagine what you could be doing if you were not carrying that burden around. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just the freedom. It's the freedom to enjoy your family. It's the freedom to enjoy your relationships, whether they're with other men or other women or everyone in between. I, I just think that there is a there is a day-to-day -day list of missed opportunities that I see just given the work we do, um, that if I could spin that around and say, this is what it looks like, imagine a world eradicated of all those missed opportunities, what would be possible uh, for men, for women and all of us. And I think that that's, that's the liberation and the power, the influence, whatever word, main, men gain that when they become active participants in this new partnership. Um, and so I would like, you know, for all of us to be able to imagine a, imagine a day without all of that emotional tax where ups, being an upstander, not a bystander was a powerful 
um, you know, a superpower that we all had and that we all had permission to use, what would the world be like? And so, you know, I just say everything as my answer to what's possible yeah. here. No, I think all three of you have been so articulate in formulating answers to these questions. And I really do wish we could, could move on. Uh, but I'd like to just thank you so much for your contributions here. We're getting towards the, uh, uh, the witching hour. Uh, one, one thing I'll say uh, from my experience is that we all have blind spots, we all have facades, and we all have our own self-development program that we're working on. I think it gets very complicated when power is introduced into the situation. And so the pandemic, I've noticed that people not going to the power structures of buildings actually have loosened them up somewhat to that friendship uh, uh, with other men, uh, for sure. So there's a lot there to explore. We do that at Leaders by Design. Uh, and uh, I thank you so much, Michael, Carolyn, Alan. Uh, it's, it's been great. We should uh, use this uh, dialogue as the basis of a, a product of some kind, an article, uh, because I think some very good thoughts have come out and we should capture that for other people to take advantage of. So thank you so much, appreciate it. Good luck out there in California. And hopefully Elwin is gonna come and save us now. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Michael.